Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Elizabeth Chance Podcast. Today is episode 341 with Dr. James Guilfoyle from Philadelphia. Before we get this party started with you, Jim, i am got to do a little ad here. So imagine you've just gotten sober. You're working your program, checking in with the recovery coach, maintaining employment, and well, thriving. Now imagine none of your closest friends or families believes you. So much trust is lost during active addiction, and it can be hard to convince loved ones that things are different, that you're different. Soberlink can help. Soberlink's remote alcohol monitoring system is designed to help you sustain a sober lifestyle while rebuilding trust with loved ones. It's small enough to fit in your purse or pocket and discreet enough to use in public. Soberlink's devices combine a facial recognition, tamper detection, and real-time results so your friends and family know instantly that you're sober and working towards your recovery goals. As a certified recovery recovery specialist myself, I can't think of a better tool to maintain accountability, strengthen community, and prove sobriety to loved ones. Make 2023 a memorable one. Visit www.soberlink.com slash BLS to sign up and receive $50 off your first device. Are you there? How are you? I am good. Don't you love that ad? I have to say, Soberlink sounds like a cool thing. They didn't have that when I was getting sober. Yeah, yeah that's a great idea. Isn't it wonderful? Yep. So tell us, for one, I want to hear, you've been a psychiatrist for practicing for how many years? We talked about this the other day. Yeah, just about 50. Uh, two more and it'll be 50. That's crazy. And you studied at Penn. Right. That was my big trip. That was coming up north for three years. And uh, 50 years later, <laughs> I'm still here. And I want to ask you, what? why did you get into psychiatry? Well, I grew up uh, in a uh, rural area of Louisiana. So... <laughs> People may feel that's redundant, but uh, uh, I grew up in the northeast part of the state, a big farming area, a uh, big cotton farm is called the Louisiana Delta and small town. And uh, when I was and I, I thought I was going to be a doctor, a lawyer or something like that. And then uh, when I was around 13, my father said to me uh, that my mother was depressed and she was uh, in some treatment and uh he just wanted me to try to be more understanding to her uh, and uh, not that I hadn't been or anything. And uh, so I, I felt depressed. What the hell is he talking about? I mean, seemed okay to me. Yeah, she was, she wasn't lying in bed crying all day or anything like that. Um, and I had that notion. I think everybody does when they're growing up, at least in those days that, uh, It'd be crazy to go to a psychiatrist, and she didn't seem crazy to me. And uh, it was a time when I was starting to uh, question my parents and starting to see some of the hypocritical things they did. And I'd say, "Well, I don't, I don't agree with that," or something. You know, take issue with them. And uh, I noticed over the next couple of years that my mother. Uh, instead of getting defensive when I would say something like that, she would listen to me and she would say, you know, Jimmy, I think maybe you have a point there. Or maybe I think you're right. And I'm like, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, what, what's, what's going on here? You know, it's like all of a sudden your, your mother's listening to you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and she, you know, she just seemed lighter and uh, she and I would talk and we would talk about the, the things we noticed in the town, you know, small town, you got all these, you know, as an adolescent, you just, you're zoned into people being hypocritical. And uh, so uh, we would talk about that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, and she would tell me about some of the insights she had about her family and her witch of a mother. And, uh, so, and she would, 
she would talk about how she was learning that in psychiatry. And uh, you know, I was a real worrier. Uh, I was a straight A student and all that. And uh, you know, playing football was really important to me and doing well in athletics was important. Obviously being successful with the ladies and uh, <laughs> you know, and you're feeling very uh, lacking in confidence when you're uh, 13, 14. And uh, so I remember just sitting there at the table in the kitchen one day and I looked up at her and I said, uh, Mom, I think I want to go see that psychiatrist. And uh, she said, oh, great. And uh, she set it up. And the next uh, uh, week, uh, or whatever, we went over there and it was a town about 60 miles away, a town called Monroe. And uh, I remember walking in the waiting room. I remember reading the Life magazine and then walking in his office and he had a big couch. She was driving over. To, she was in analysis. I mean, she was seeing him three times a week. And she must have told me just to talk about whatever was on my mind and just, you know, just let it go because I just let it go. And, and I started twitching. I started like, you know, my, I mean, it's big, my shoulder was just like twitching now. And I'm sitting there thinking, what the hell? You know, I'd never done that before or since, fortunately. But after a while, I said, look, Dr. Long, I got to lie down on that couch. <laughs> you know? So I lay down on the couch and I just spilled my guts. And uh, he reassured me about some things. And uh, just you, when I walked out of there, Elizabeth, I felt like an anvil had been lifted off my shoulders. I mean, it was just, I felt wonderful. And, and on the drive back home, I turned to my mother and I said, you know, mama, I think I want to be a psychiatrist. And that was it. I mean, I you know, maybe wavered a little bit in medical school as I was uh, not enjoying the biochemistry and all that stuff. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, I, that's what I followed through on. And, uh, you know, I got up to Penn and uh, did my residency there and got into treatment there, which was a lifesaver and just wonderful. Uh, but that's it. Your parents were so forward thinking, weren't they? Think well, back to that time. That was really, I mean, they were pretty progressive, weren't they? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, I went to um, my 50th high school reunion, whenever that was. And one of the, uh, one of my friends from high school said, Yo, boy, you know, your father was a very progressive farmer. I mean, he had a lot of kind of very creative ideas about farming. and He was ahead of his time. But I didn't appreciate how my mother, having the guts to see somebody, she may have said, I had to see somebody kind of thing. Uh, to, to handle her uh, crazy relationship with her mother. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it took a lot of guts in those days because like I said, everybody thought you were crazy if you were going to psychiatrist. And I know they were talking about my mother. I mean, I, you know, I heard the scuttlebutt in town. Yeah, Guilfoyle's mother, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. But I say kudos to them and your father even taking you aside and saying, guess what? This is what's going on because so many parents keep it in the closet. They're too ashamed. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really appreciate his telling me to uh, be sensitive to her and try to be helpful. So just, you're so blessed. I, I always tell your daughter that I have to throw this, I have to throw in a caveat. His daughter is one of my closest friends and she got to, every time I say, oh, I'm going on this trip. She's like, oh, I've already been there. Oh, I've already been there. <laughs> well, my mother took it to all those places. <laughs> yeah. It's so cool. So when, did you know about alcoholism be prior to becoming a psychiatrist? Do you know anything about it? No, no. Um, what happened was, um, well, we grew up in Louisiana. We we went to New Orleans regularly to to dine, and that was always, uh, you know, New Orleans is always a part of. Well, I mean, we would dine and drink and stuff like that. But uh, my father would always have a drink uh, after work, uh, but. I left home, things were still okay. And then uh, when 
around the time, a little, about a year after I got married, I got married right when I started medical school. And a year after that, my uncle died and my uncle and my father were very, very close. Mm. My father, I think he got quite depressed after that and he became a raging alcoholic. I mean, he would go on benders and I wasn't at home at the time, but I was hearing this from my mother and my brother who were there. And they would talk about how, well, you know, he just, uh, he just, we tried to get him to go to AA and he just won't go and he just kind of want to do it. And, and so they were feeling kind of helpless. And uh, I got into treatment uh, during my first year of residency at Penn. And it turned out this was, I, <laughs> I walked in the psychiatrist's office and uh, he says, uh, I happened to pick his the uh, one of my preceptors at uh, PGH, uh, Philadelphia General Hospital, said uh, he is the, see one of these two guys. I mentioned this guy and another guy. This guy was Ed Taylor, wonderful, wonderful fellow. And uh, I walked in to see him. He was out at the institute in West Philly, and uh, he he says, uh, "So where are you from?" And I said, uh, "Small town in Louisiana." And he said, "Well, I'm from Louisiana." And I said. You what? You are? <laughs> and he was from Shreveport, which is, I was from the northeast corner. He was from the northwest corner. And he said, so where'd you go to school? And I said, uh, LSU. He said, well, I went to Tulane. <laughs> and, then, and we got to talking, I don't know, something about college and being in the fraternities. It's what fraternity were you in? I said, I, I was a KA. And he said, I was a KA too. <laughs> somebody following me or something. I mean, what the hell is this? But uh, as I talked with him and talked with uh, him about what was happening with my father and I, uh, you know, I, I had, I remember one time we were in New Orleans and he was just blind drunk uh, in, in Antoine's and it was just, it was embarrassing. And uh, uh, so he, he talked with me about, alcoholism helping me understand it and then uh we had gone home for christmas uh my wife and uh we had a little daughter uh then and uh so we went home for the holiday i went to lake uh, went to my hometown and uh in the middle of opening the presents i got up to walk back to the kitchen and i walked back and i saw him guzzling out of a vodka bottle and i had the impulse to go and just grab the bottle from him but i was i didn't do it and I walked back into the living room and then we flew home a couple of days later and uh, I flew back to Philly and um, I went and talked to Ed, uh, Ed Taylor. And uh, he said, Jim, you need to call him. And they said, you know, call him first thing in the morning, the morning after the night before. And uh, uh, you tell him he's got to go to AA and, you know, tell you my, tell your mom, tell your brother so they'll be and you know my mother said oh don't do it don't do it oh no 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 he's just gonna go crazy you know blah 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 I said mom I'm doing it and I was nervous as hell but it was a Thursday morning I remember called him around seven o'clock and uh I said daddy uh you you were guzzling out of a vodka bottle uh, on Christmas morning uh, you are a drunk you're you're an alcoholic, you need to go to AA. And that was about it. And about a week later, I got a nasty letter from him about how I didn't understand him and all this crap, you know. <laughs> and, I, and I knew that was crap, you know. And I just took that letter and crumpled it and tossed it in the uh, wastebasket. And he never said a word to me about it. And I never sort of said a word to him about it. But he got into AA and, uh, shortly there after that phone call and he uh was helping people out in aa and that summer when we went back to visit he had me go to an aa meeting in our hometown and i think that was his way of apologizing to me and telling me that he understood and he appreciated what i had done uh but so that's that was my introduction to it so i was when I 
started my move my practice out to the institute i was uh, just gravitated toward working with people on the there was a strecker unit out there mm-hmm. and, uh, I, <laughs> I, knew, I knew about the bullshit and all that stuff so what would you say how, how do you think alcoholism is today especially after what happened with covid and people being locked in their homes and all of that how do you has do you think it's ramped up or has it stayed status quo what would you say well it's always with us i mean people abusing substances uh whether it's alcohol cocaine pot whatever uh i think anything it's kind of tricky uh you know it's kind of like after 9 11 after some big event like that uh, people say talk about how traumatic it is but people come together the thing about this whole uh, covid thing and this lockdown thing was it was discouraging people from gathering and being supportive i mean they had to do zoom meetings and this kind of crap and uh so i think people lost a lot of social support and and i think the numbers show that suicides went up addiction went up so i think it uh, i think it ramped things up quite a bit and i i think it was well <laughs> i don't want to get too much on a soapbox but i think the way it was handled uh just unconscionable so well i'm in agreement because i always went during covid you know i had the podcast going and i'd have people on from all different countries and they'd talk about how the liquor store was still open but they couldn't go to church and they yeah. couldn't go meet their friends at a meeting. You couldn't go to an AA meeting. I mean, luckily, if you were in Florida, they were meeting outside, right? And But if you're in Canada or New York or Philadelphia, it was freezing cold. And where are you going to meet everybody? I think it was just crazy. They didn't let people meet. Well, a liquor store was an essential business, right? So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh terrible so i want to talk to you now about marijuana for a little bit so now marijuana is legal in certain states it's not legal in the state of florida where i am it's not legal in philadelphia is it well i don't know i mean they just i don't know i don't think they're dispensaries in philadelphia but i think they're dispensaries in pa i know there are in jersey i'm not sure about pennsylvania but i'm not up on all that stuff so I've always thought it was interesting. I'm going to tell you a really quick story. So when I was first sober, I had about a year and I was, I had a girlfriend that was driving with me to pick up Kent from camp, right? We were driving to New Hampshire and we arrive in New Hampshire and she quickly jumps out of the car and she runs and she jumps, she goes out on our little patio in this hotel room. And she's like, do you want to smoke some weed? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm sober. Like we're in AA together. What are you talking about? And she's like, he was was in AA with you. Yes. So she said, Oh, it's alcoholics anonymous, not weed anonymous. Oh God. Uh, 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 uh. Well, I'm, I'm not for legalizing it. I mean, um, you know, I'm, um, I think, it, it came into the society in a big way when uh, we were, my age group was in uh, college and it sort of became accepted. And we all said back in those days, oh, well, you know, it's not as bad as alcohol. I mean, alcohol, obviously you get drunk, you have a car accident, this kind of thing. But pot is much more, to me, the real problem with pot is how insidious it is. How people think, oh, you just smoke a little, you get mellow, and what's the harm in that? But it gets stored in the body, in the fat cells, long, long term. And you have what you call reverse tolerance. So that as opposed to with alcohol, how you have to drink more and more and more and more because you've gotten so you can tolerate lower dosages, lower doses of alcohol. With pot, when you smoke, it releases, it gets, it sort of signals the pot to be released into your bloodstream. So it takes less pot to get you high. So Mm -hmm. when chronic smokers, they're stoned all the time. 
And of course, oh yeah, I'm fine. I mean, they all, you know, they're de deluding themselves. I mean, I've seen so many kids just uh, become amotivational, lose their motivation and just start just coasting through life. And, and too often I've seen the parents say, well, yeah, you know, but no problem or you know, not, not see a real big issue with it. So uh, I'm very much against it and against all this, uh, you know, this medical marijuana stuff, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my God, somebody's got a mer medical marijuana card because they have headaches and, uh, you know, so, and take it for their anxiety. I've had, I've had patients come in and say, would, would you prescribe me some or say it's okay for my anxiety? And I say, no, I would not do that. <laughs> I say, you want to be able to do a poster, poster for marijuana? You go ahead and do it, but I'm not doing it. No, no. Yeah. And interestingly enough, I find out, find that they now have these gummies, which I am hearing more and more people that are my age and older are t getting prescribed these gummies. Yeah. And I remember now we bring back another story when Hadley was little, so I took her to the dentist and they talked about marijuana being a gateway drug. Would you say it's a gateway drug? Yeah, sure. Oh, absolutely. People use it and, uh, uh, you know, if they get in, it, look, some people use it, don't have a problem with it. Some people use alcohol, don't have a problem with it. But the people who get into it and get into chronic usage, uh, the pot in itself is going to screw them up, but it's likely to lead to them trying something else, uh, you know, maybe an upper like cocaine or something like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's bad news. So once it opens those receptors, which then you go and you start doing other things. So when... Now, this is another thing that's been talked about a lot lately is okay. using these mushrooms and psychedelics, right, to change your brain chemistry. And I'm going to do another story. I'm gonna, so someone called me and they're like, oh, my gosh, I have the answer. You need to come out here and I'm going to give you some of these mushrooms. It's going to change your life. And I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't, well, for one, I didn't like doing that stuff when I was, when I was partying, but today they're like, oh, it's going to be the new change. It's going to replace AA. It's going to take away all the rehabs aren't going to be rehabs anymore. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I, all I thought about was you. I wanted to just get your opinion on what you thought about this and taking these psychedelics and who you take and what you're, what you might be walking into Pandora's box. Yeah. Well, um, I checked out that study you talked about. You mentioned something about that psilocybin study. And I looked at the study. It's actually a pretty good study. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I mean, <laughs> we went through this back in the 60s. They were, uh, they were dropping acid to try to help people and see if they, and see about, uh, uh, I don't know if they were actually trying to treat schizophrenia or something like that then, but uh, I mean, you saw all the problems that that led to, and here here we are doing it again, and uh, they're doing, uh, people are trying to find a magic bullet mm. for, addiction, mm. for addiction. Well, yeah, everybody would love a magic bullet. I mean, that's that's a great you know, it's a great idea, but it's a fantasy. It's a naive fantasy. Because as you know, I mean, addiction, mental, anything mental <laughs> ain't short term in general. Uh, it's not like you got a pneumonia and we give you that penicillin and you're going to get better. You're going to die in a few days and most, everybody pretty much gets better. Well, you're talking addiction, you're talking something that develops over a long period of time and something's going to take, it's going to take the rest of your life mm -hmm. to, to address it. Uh, and, and so everybody wants to get the magic, but well, psilocybin, LSD, uh, and then right now they're trying ketamine, ketamine for depression. I mean, it's like ketamine, ketamine, uh, anesthesiologists had the highest rates of addiction in the, med in the medical profession. And that's because they are exposed to these very addictive substances. 
And so they start using it to handle their stress or their feelings. I mean, they are in a bad way. And ketamine is the number one uh, substance they use. Now, you give it to somebody who's depressed, it's, you give, give them an opiate or something like that, yeah, they'll feel better, of course. I mean, you feel better when you take these things. They, they have some appeal. They give you great feelings. Yeah, okay. Well, that's, that's why people get addicted to them, you know? But uh, I had a friend of mine. I was having lunch uh, with him, and uh, he said, yeah, I had this patient so depressed, so depressed. I just wound up giving him an opiate. And I said, you what? He said, yeah, I mean, nothing else worked. And I'm thinking, nothing else worked? Well, I would have tried ECT, shock. or I mean, I, I would certainly have tried that. Uh, but yeah, nothing else worked. And I'm thinking, so what happened? He said, well, got a lot better, got a lot of benefit from it. And I said, Okay, I said, whoo, man, you're playing with fire. And I met, I saw him a year later, and I said, uh, well, what happened to that patient uh, that you told me about that one was so depressed, you gave him the opiate and everything? I said, oh, well, he did get addicted. I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, no, shit. It's like, oh, my God. You know, do no harm. That's what, and why do you think, I want to get your opinion. Why do you think AA is like the best for helping people stay sober? I have my own opinions, but I want your opinions of why you think it works so well. Well, yeah, I, I agree. That That is my feeling about it because I've seen it work and be more helpful. Now, I know some people, a uh, handful over the years, who've sort of dabbled in it, but don't. Yeah, it doesn't. It turns them off for various reasons. But I, you know, they they come up with different rationalizations, like not not digging the religious aspects or the spiritual stuff, or uh, you know. But I I, I don't really buy that as uh, you know, because because I've known plenty of people who were not that spiritual or religious and who still, you know, really felt it was very very helpful. Uh, I. Um, it, it's just the best thing out there. I mean, it's, uh, it acknowledges, uh, the, the, um, the whole process of addiction, uh, and, uh, the, the grip that that process has on you and how powerless you are in dealing with it. And I think, and the support that you get from the community is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And people you know, who will be your sponsor and then help you uh, as you struggle with these sorts of things. I, I just think the whole program is just wonderful in the way it gives, uh, get, provides support for people in their struggles and helps them, uh, it helps him get over the shame they have about being addicted because that's a big part of any, any sort of treatment for anything, you know, getting to the point where, well, I'm a nut, you know, it's like, yeah, that's my craziness. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I blew that one, you know, I mean, I talk with people about neurosis all the time about how we all do things that, uh, screw us over and uh you know and it's like there i did it again you know <laughs> let, let, let's see let's see if we can kind of you know maybe stop that from happening in the future kind of thing it's um it's so for me it's been so great because it is that whole shame i had for so long and now i can ha you know i fly my freak flag and i like that's who i am and enjoy it and I just take me, take it or leave it. And I think it's not it's like get, going back to what we started talking about in the very beginning with your mom. It's like you got to see that from when you were young and to be able to share that, like just knowing that inside of you when you're working with patients must be so wonderful because you walked through that sort of thing with your family. 
Well, yeah, but I, you know, I, I, that started me on the journey, but getting on your own journey of self-discovery, like what I went through with my own therapy, uh, that's where you, uh, you know, I, uh, I'll, <laughs> cause I got into treatment and I was thinking, well, I'm going to do this so I can be a better psychiatrist, you know, so that I can sort of, you, we all said, yeah, so I can learn about my issues. And but we really didn't mean it. You know, it was like, that was bullshit. It was just, <laughs> you know, this was, this was kind of virtue signaling for, for that era. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to show I'm really committed to learning about myself and working on myself. But I really didn't mean it, and I really didn't think I needed it. And then about a year and a half in, I remember the day I was sitting there, and I thought, I was sitting there talking to Ed, and I thought, yeah, I really need this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you start to see your craziness and accept it and not try to hide it from yourself anymore, and, and, and doing that frees you up, you know, it's just, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I think that that's the whole process to me. That's what AA is all about. It's all about, Hey, we're all powerless. Hey, we can't, you know, we can't control it, man. I, I gotta be careful that uh, alcoholic self of mine walking by that bar. Cause I might just walk in there, you know? And so I always, and we're going to finish with this. I think it's always so interesting when people come in to them. And for one, a lot of people don't want to even walk into a meeting because it's so scary. And I admit when I went to my first meeting, it was the scariest thing I've ever done. Like it was scarier than getting married, having babies, buying cars, buying houses. It was like, wait a minute. I've got to walk in here and raise my hand and say, hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm an alcoholic. Now it feels like second nature, but there's so many people that are that ego that we have that just won't even take to pull that door open and say, you know what? I want the help. And I do think that no. I need the help. Right. And yeah. I think it might be the best thing that came from COVID was the zoom meetings because people can don't have to be present and yeah. they feel so right. Exposed. Well, I mean, I, I still prefer the in-person stuff. I mean, because that's more powerful. But it, it, when you when you can't do it, it, it beats nothing. So, so you don't. So you don't think people should go out and start doing weed, smoking weed and replacement of alcohol and start tripping on all different whatever things. God Almighty! God Almighty! Well, isn't it, couldn't you literally, if you took it with someone that wasn't a psychiatrist, you could like have a psychotic break and the person wouldn't know what to do with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, look, people, there's some people can't tolerate weed. They get uh, severe panic attacks and some people will go psychotic, but certainly with uh, acid and uh, psilocybin, it's, it's more of a danger. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, yeah, it was fun. I enjoyed talking to you. I love talking to you. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, you guys, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me and I will forward it to Dr. Gilfoyle. And um, please, until next week, keep getting busy, living sober. I'm going to Europe, everybody. So I'll be sending this over from the other side of the pond. Thanks, Jim. I'll talk to you soon. All right, bye-bye.